why I emphasize science so much is uh, I see this you know dilemma, which is that we do live in a time of extraordinary burgeoning science. I mean, literally, there are there are thousands more planets than when I was born. Um, we know so much more about how the human brain works. We're mysteries of, of how cells work and the, the, the genetics. We understand this so much more profoundly all the time. And yet a lot of the, the public finds it difficult to keep up with this. Um, it finds it difficult and sometimes that, that difficulty translates uh, into boredom or outright antagonism. And that's, that's not what we, we need. We, we know that science and technology are pervasive in our lives all the time. And it, a lot of challenges go along with this all the time. So we need, as, as a civilization, we need people to have a, a certain level of, of science literacy or fluency, however that's defined, um, so that they're just able to function happily as, as citizens and, and within their own lives that much more. Um, we all know, you know the issues about how the important STEM is as a, as a, as a pillar of uh, economic growth, and I won't belabor that. That's the, the part we you know, all have, have talked about a lot. But, but I think we also all know that science and technology and having some level of of comfort with those concepts, at least some of them, uh, is is uh, is really crucial for people to be uh, working members of today's world. And there are so many things that create obstacles to this. It's been talked a lot about the idea of a digital divide. That there are there are different kinds of things that create these wedges uh, that drive people apart between rich and poor and their access to these technologies and how readily they may be prepared to participate in this. We see similar kinds of wedges that, uh, that affect uh, how fully women get to participate in, in this. Um, we need to do more of this in, in every possible way to, to try to overcome that. But it's fantastic to see that this kind of enthusiasm does exist here in this library base, and that's what I want to try to feed, and I'm so happy to see that the discussion of the use of maker spaces has gone past just the idea of, gee, this might have something to offer. And that's really the spirit in which I'd like to, to try to conduct today's session as much as anything else. I'd like to try to push that conversation forward. That we're all basically on board with the idea that maker spaces and this kind of, of passion-driven, curiosity-driven science can be an important part of better STEM education. Now let's figure out how to do it. So I think that the three things I want to try to get back to at different times during today, I want to, to really talk about that issue of how to do it. How do we overcome different kinds of obstacles? The kinds of obstacles you run into, whatever sort. They may be administrative, they may be technical or technological, they may be just money, they may be issues of training. Whatever they are, that's something I think that we want to try to be able to try address today. Um, I think we, we also want to try to make sure that we're getting this to all the constituencies that need to be served. We talked about in the title of this, how do we make sure that this is relevant to everybody throughout life? And then also, I really I wanted to, to, to try to bring back that idea of making sure that we are not just creating a different kind of diversion for people, that how do we try to make sure that what we're doing with the makerspaces is genuinely connecting back with the need to try to, to push people forward in their education. Um, to that end, I'm really so glad that we've been able to pull together the absolutely wonderful first-rate set of panelists that we have here today. Um, let me introduce them to you. First of all, we, we have Sharona Ginsberg. Um, she is the, the Learning Technologies Librarian at the, the uh, SUNY Oswego. Her interests obviously involve things like ha hacker spaces and uh, maker spaces. But really, fundamentally, she is about trying to use technology to enhance learning and improve people's lives in any way. You may also already know her as the founder and coordinator of MakerBridge, which is this community for anyone, but most especially for librarians and educators who are interested in trying to use makerspaces uh, to, for, for, for whatever purposes. Um, and this past year, uh, it was really only appropriate that the Library Journal uh, recognized her as one of its movers and shakers. So very glad to have Sharona here today. Uh, seated beside her is Claire Moore. Uh, Claire 
is the head of uh, children's services at the Darien Library in Darien, Connecticut. Um, she was previously the programs coordinator for the library. She's member of the uh, School Age Programs and Services Committee of the ALSC uh, and also part of its digital content task force. Uh, she's prevented at, uh, presented at uh, various national conferences on all sorts of creative technologies and ways of using that to infuse more energy into children's programming. So very glad to have here. And someone else that I'm also really uh, been so happy to have on, on other uh, uh, panels and that I, I, I will flatter myself to try to think of him as actually a friend these days, is Mark Hatch. Um, we here at McGraw-Hill Education are obviously very glad to claim him as the author of the Maker Manifesto. But he is, dare I say, at least as importantly, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Tech Shop, which is a creative uh, community and workspaces uh, uh, that uh, it has locations across the country. Uh, and uh, this is where people can get the access to the kinds of tools and training and software that they need to, to literally make their, their dreams uh, come true. And really, under his leadership, he's been able to make Tech Shop into to really the, the premier brand in the makerspace. You you can see uh, there in uh, the, the picture that's uh, on screen of uh, a certain obscure American president uh, who uh, last year uh, was uh, giving an important address about uh, his own initiatives in education, and he chose to do that at a, a tech shop location. Um, so I think that speaks to really the importance of this idea of using maker spaces as uh, a lever for improving uh, the state of, of STEM education even now. So, so glad to, to have all of you here. Um, and so we're going to, to talk to the panelists, really a conversation more than just a straight up presentations from everybody. Uh, later on, we're going to move over and, and really get into what is probably at least as valuable a part of this, which is the Q&A, uh, the conversation that we will have with you. And if today's session is anything like some of the previous ones we've had, that is often a real highlight uh, of, of this because it's a great opportunity for any of the sorts of tips and experiences that you've had that you're able to share with everyone else here uh, it's, can be a wonderful way of enhancing the experience uh, of all of this. So definitely uh, looking forward to that part as well. Um, to kick things off, um, maybe I, I guess I will actually turn to you, Claire, first, if, if I can. Um, you are down in the trenches on this. But you know, as somebody who has been very directly involved in, in doing this kind of programming and developing these sorts of experiences at, at a library, um, maybe you can talk about some of the kinds of successes that you've had with this at, uh, at the, the Darien Library. Okay, so I'm just going to go through some highlights of some of the programs that we've offered for the past two years now. So we have a makerspace in the Children's Library, and it's called the T Room. So T stands for Technology, Engineering, and the Arts. So <laughs> we put our A in there uh, very confidently. Uh, so this is an example of one of our robotics programs that we did. Um, and what we've done, we've tried to collaborate each summer with the teen department. Um, we have one teen librarian on staff, uh, and we just thought it would be very um, beneficial to that tween age group to kind of combine, especially kind of moving up so it's around ages 10 to 14. Um, and also what we like to do during the summer is take the kids and teens outside as much as possible. So this is an example of, um, we just did one of our solar robots classes where we um, put them together and test them out on the fountain. Um, and it was also nice to uh, have some parents helping out. And what we've tried to do over the past year especially is to um, just kind of uh, strengthen our intergenerational programming. So you'll see in one of our examples, we started hosting uh, more family programs as well. And so this is part of, uh, just last week we did a uh, robotics class for different age groups um, as part of our summer reading program. And kind of what we've, something that we're just getting into now. Um, and the hope is also to eventually circulate technology within the children's library. Um, so hopefully, so this is an example of uh, our Finch robots that we purchased. Um, so what we did, we had uh, grades two to three, uh, just put, putting bristle bots or brush bots together. Um, so kind of trying to expand the age groups there. 
Uh, and then we bought Sphero robots to kind of have the kids in fourth, fifth grade age group just play around, take them outside, do tricks and stuff, um, just to kind of engage and also just to have them um, have some fun, especially as the weather was getting warmer in our area of the country. Um, and then Finch Robots is actually where we brought in some of the coding elements. And um, what we use, we, we tested them out using uh, the Scratch platform um, and other coding languages are also available. Uh, but that's something we've also had um, a lot more coding programs. There's one. Um, so when I started doing a coding program, I kind of focused on using our tablets or iPads um, and primarily using Hopscotch. Uh, just doing a very basic intro to coding program for kids not only in grades two to three but also um, in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And there's actually a great um, ebook that was written by someone. Um, his name is Wes. <laughs> I, I can get the name, but um, a lot of that is providing challenges. So once you learn the basics, so um, I, I mean, I'm not a coder, um, so this was something that was uh, new for me. And uh, just by using some of the resources that are out there, and I think we're going to talk about different resources a little later, um, just having it be in a lot of the kids just taking the initiative to not only teach themselves, but also <laughs> teach the librarians in many cases. Uh, but something that has happened in the past year is that we started hosting or renting uh, one of our tech labs to a group of homeschoolers, and they've just been having a coding class each Friday. Um, and then with that, just as they're uh, enhancing their skills, one of the nine or 10 year olds started teaching with his mom one of our uh, coding classes for kids. And they've been learning JavaScript over the past six months. And it's pretty much a six week class, but we found that by the end of those classes, they want to extend the time. Um, and the mom and the young boy have been very supportive and uh, just open to kind of learning as they're teaching, which is awesome. So that's sort of a little bit of pulling the resources from within the community uh, to see what you can, um, what programs you can offer. So yeah, this is the idea of, uh, we have our um, McGraw Fellow, which uh, a librarian who's with us for two years, and she had the idea to um, have family maker challenges on Saturdays, especially in the winter time. Um, we find that our, there's a lot of movement in the children's library, especially as the um, strong winter happens. It's, we're in Connecticut, so it was quite snowy this year. Uh, so what we decided to do is twice a month just offer uh, maker challenges for families. And some of the programs we've offered, we've had kids and their parents and grandparents and siblings uh, draw self-portraits. Uh, we've had them create boats to see um, which boats can float. And then this was probably our most popular, which was of the egg drop challenge. <laughs> and a lot of our programs, I think, and some of you might relate, that when you create them, you have an idea as to what age group they would be specific for. And I mean, just personally, my leanings tend to be higher. So, oh, this is perfect for kids in older grades. But as you can see here, even um, preschoolers and kids in the, in the lower elementary grades definitely have fun, and, and especially because they're working with with their grown-ups um, just makes it makes for a very successful program. And 3D printing, so uh, these are two of my colleagues. And uh, they, they actually found dinosaur necklaces, which have been <laughs> Amy, who's on, she's on the right, she's, she's a big fan of dinosaurs. So um, we decided, because we do have a 3D, we have a maker bot in our children's tea room. And um, we started off a lot of, so the tea room actually, you can rent the space, uh, child can rent it with their grown-ups, um, but we also host a lot of our programs within that space. Uh, we do have a maker bot, and we decided that we were trying to find out other options besides we have intro to maker bot programs, we have Tinkercad programs, but we wanted to do something, especially around the holidays, so we had holiday gift giving options. So we just pulled for, um, for younger kids as well, well as older, um, just trying to find uh, items that you can print out, but you can also um, creatively draw on them or put them together, make necklaces. So this was one of our ideas. Um, but still trying to, um, we still offer as much as possible just those intro classes on, on 3D technology in general and finding that a lot of even younger kids are very interested in uh, that technology. And, and a lot of uh, younger children also reserve the room as well. So Roots and Shoots. So this is actually a program that I took on when I first started at Darien Library, which was six six years ago. Um, so, and I was always 
a fan of Jane Goodall. <laughs> and uh, for some of you, who, if you might not have heard of Roots and Shoots, it's her initiative for young people teaching them how to um, just come up with projects and ways to benefit not only animals, but also people in the environment. Uh, so I started doing a Roots and Shoots program for about two years, and we had a small group that was meeting, kind of essentially like a club meeting at the mm -hmm. library. Uh, and we would host, this is an Earth Day program that they, the kids decided to host themselves, and they came up with the idea. So um, we're actually bringing back Roots and Shoots this summer. Uh, so just, you know, it, I added this slide because I'm just very passionate, especially teaching kids not only the science elements, but also a little bit of social responsibility. And we can take, we've hosted programs or had programs where um, the kids are teaching about the use of plastic bags. And also we did one where we created a video um, trying to spread uh, the... The goal is to end typhoid in Africa by hand washing. So just thinking of those ways that uh, we can just teach children how to be socially engaged and soldering. <laughs> so I never thought when I became a children's librarian that I would be soldering in the library. <laughs> but uh, I have. So for um, last May, we started. Uh, and this was, one, and again, one of our intergenerational programs where we brought uh, we had grandparents as well as parents coming in to just do a very basic intro to soldering program where they were, um, we got these the badges from, I think, uh, the Maker Shed. Uh, but just teaching them how to solder and then taking this year, we actually had them put together a little robot and a name badge as well. So just taking those skills and um, just offering it on a Saturday. You know, the weather's nice, but we can open the windows cap the fire alarms <laughs> <It'll go off. laughs> and uh but yeah no i mean just very a very and very encouraging to you for us um i think the parents were just very you know they they've always communicated that they never thought a lot of what we've been doing would happen in a library which i think is very encouraging we've also uh just done a lot of programs with uh the use of leds whether that's doing squishy circuits or uh here's where we we made LED throwies, which I actually found out about from a conference. Uh, so a lot of a lot of what we were showing you today definitely can be uh, just adapted. And another uh, another program that I love because I love photography is light painting. Uh, so that's where we've been actually going throughout the library. We had to use a dark space, like a dark dark tunnel within the library. So using that, just teaching kids about. Um, exposures and shutter speed and things like that and just having them get really creative with it and look at the results. Terrariums. <laughs> so this is also uh, a program that we did uh, in, in December and we actually borrowed this from our adult programming department. Uh, so taking some of those great uh, programs that are offered by our adults and kind of adapting them for children as well. And iPads and art. So you mentioned about creativity. So uh, each each year we have a tech series, and uh, what I've been doing is um, offering an app art class where we take various apps that children are able to use, whether it's photography apps, drawing apps, animation apps, uh, and just having them create artwork that we actually display in the tea room uh, to, to just have them using technology to do something you, know, you wouldn't expect, just creating artwork by using that tool. And this is an example, so one of our stop motion programs and that's that's what the tea room looked like before so we repurposed the space which at one point was our tech lab uh, and have been offering classes within that space it's small but it works what, what are some examples of the kinds of hurdles you had to clear to get to seemingly this happy result uh, well yeah soldering well the ca caps were one one um, and we actually had our our assistant director who's head of technology as well. He actually taught us and helped us because when I first opened up the kit, I was at my house and had no experience with it. I didn't solder in high school or anything. Um, and just almost in tears, like, I don't, what, what are all these pieces? Like, I don't understand. So you, it can be really challenging. Uh, but communicating with, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I mean our library is very good about uh, just offering assistance. And, you know, he didn't have to come down and for an hour and, and help us, but also... <laughs> most likely enjoyable for him as well. Um, but also I mentioned with coding, I mean, I, I don't, and, and I think we talked about this before, like I, I wouldn't have thought of myself as being, um, leaning towards uh, excelling in science or, or technology as well, but um, just being committed to learn as well. I think as librarians, we're, we're committed to being lifelong learners. So I just taking, 
taking just big leaps and, and just hoping that, you know, some, something will come of it. And, and also, I mean, I have a really supportive staff as well. So we work collaboratively together and, um, and just, there's a lot of resources out there now and, and just committing the time to, to learning these various programs. But I mean, things, and when we're working with children, like they're, they're very flexible and understanding. So I think that that helps as well, that something you plan, and that's all part of the creativity aspect too, like something you might've planned might take a different direction. I'm just curious, just in sense of, of kind of reading the crowd on this, uh, because I imagine that there is, of course, the wide range of, of different l levels of involvement in any of this or desire to be involved in any of it. I'm just curious, out of the, I don't know, a couple of hundred people who are here right now or whatever, um, how, how many of you have some kind of makerspace programs in place at your libraries, your institutions right now? Okay, yeah, no, good. I said I'm a little tough to judge, but I'm going to say it's probably about half that crowd, and I'm not, not too surprised with that. Now, I'm, I am curious, and I will throw this question out to not just the people who just raised their hand or the people who did not raise their hand. How many of you here, when you look at this general subject of trying to increase uh, the availability of these kinds of projects in your institution, does the sheer intimidation factor uh, register for you. How many of you, and you can you know, close your eyes so nobody wants to be ashamed, but, I'm, but how many of you genuinely feel intimidated about the idea of, oh, I guess I'm going to have to learn what a software sketch is. I'm going to have to learn how to do something. I'm going to have to learn how to solder. Um, who, I, for one, am terrified of this. <laughs> but okay, yeah, so I, I think that that's really, uh, realistic. So, so Sharona, now you uh, obviously you're involved with with you know a community of people and uh, a lot of different different institutions. Can, when you hear uh, what Claire's experience was like at Darien, can you sort of put that in context with um, the the level of success, the level of, of difficulty, or some of the other kinds of experiences that uh, that, that that you hear about? Are there are there sort of other common obstacles that come up that uh, that that people talk about in uh, at Makerbridge? I definitely the training issue is a big obstacle that comes up like you know oh I am a librarian I have an English degree all of a sudden I have to learn circuits or I have to learn 3d printing and that's totally beyond my scope so that's something that I've definitely heard about uh, I think a big one is getting buy-in from administration and from the people who uh, make the decisions at your library. Uh, I, I actually had someone ask me that really recently. You know, what can I do? How can I get people on board with the idea of having a makerspace with trying to uh, actually encourage this in our library? Um, and also just the idea of having to have people who are staffing the machines, who are available to fix things if they break. Uh, 3D printers definitely don't run perfectly on their own. You need to have somebody who knows how to do things, like maybe take apart the machine a little bit. Uh, so that's like a big one too. Um, and then obviously just issues of budget and space and you know what are we actually going to get? How do we get the money? Where is it going to go? Things like that. Does it seem as though there's a level at which that, that success feeds on itself in this, that as more libraries develop maker spaces, that, that that's making it easier for other ones to get the money to get over the administrative hurdles? Definitely. And I, the fact that support is growing on a national level, I think, is very helpful. It's helpful for uh, that administrative buy-in aspect of people actually being able to see this is working, this is being done in other libraries. It's not just you know, the new hot trend that's going to go away. Um, so I think that's very helpful. Uh, and I mean, something that, that I personally think is a great idea, too, to get around some of that is to not overwhelm yourself right away. So, you know, don't be like, here's a giant list of all of the equipment we need to buy, and we need to learn all of this hard stuff right away, and we need to just go in all guns blazing. But, you know, start small. I've seen a lot of really great projects like uh, mobile maker spaces or pop-up maker spaces or things that, uh, you know, sort of like the library has a maker box and it doesn't necessarily have a set space for this at the very beginning, but then it's going to grow. Uh, so I think that's really important. I think it's also really important for librarians to start with what they know, too. Uh, so, for example, if you don't know things like soldering and 3D printing and you're a little intimidated, maybe that's not the first thing that the makerspace gets. Maybe you start 
with crocheting. Maybe you start with a sewing machine. Maybe you start with things that are a little easier to learn, like squishy circuits or playing with Legos and building with Legos and things like that. Um, and I mean, definitely, I think it's also really important, especially like in a case like Claire's, to uh, talk to people in the community who do know those skills. So you were saying someone, you know, was able to show you soldering. It's not like you had to just pick up a book and figure it out on your own. So I think that's really important too, is to find those people who already exist who have these skills too. That's uh, in some of these previous discussions about this. That's one of the things that's struck me as sort of most. I don't know, at least quietly revolutionary about all of this is is how much it does hinge on the idea that um, a model of here are the authorities and they will put out the learning to the to the others doesn't apply a lot of the time to this. That it's much more complicated that the mentoring that in a lot of cases you do have, you know, the, the nine year old kids are the better mentors for the adults uh, when it comes to how to do certain kinds of things. And you have to really seri be serious about that, about being open to it and finding people who are non traditional sources of expertise because that's those are the people who know how to, to do the, 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 the sorts of things that, that, you're, that you're most involved with. Um, I just I, I note because when it comes to, to training people and getting the expertise, that's of course what Mark is all about. But I did want to just just throw this question out to still the, the two of you um, before I, I did pass it over to Mark, which is I mean Darien is a community in which obviously it's got a lot of things going for it. It's a relatively affluent community. You've got, we've got a relatively educated uh, group of families around there. It, it seems like the sort of place where if you were going to be drawing people into uh, a system of of maker spaces and using that to help push education it 's got everything going for it in that respect and i 'm just curious about what happens in libraries in communities that are less well funded or where there 's been less access to certain other kinds of of education and uh, can they easily start to achieve on some of that same kind of levels in terms of having uh, makerspace programs that are that vigorous, or, or there's sort of other sorts of adjustments that have to be made along the way on that? So yes, our community is, we're very fortunate and um, very well-educated and well-funded. Uh, but surprisingly, I mean, it, it's we've had it for two years, and uh, basically our library super users are, are the ones that first started coming. So it's, it's actually taken a while uh, for for some families within town to even know about the space or to know, I mean, because maker spaces, I think we're, we're very knowledgeable about, about that term, but it's taken quite a few years before it's kind of, I mean, you know, families and have you even know what that means. Um, so that's, it still has taken, I mean, we do have a lot of people who are still finding out about it. So that's sometimes challenging how to market it. Um, and also thinking about how people within the community, as they as they realize what the library is offering, I mean, we've had a lot of parents also tell us, especially with coding, that this is something that the schools aren't offering. So we're very thankful that you're even taking that step to kind of also have them advocate for you. Um, but in terms of other communities, yes, I mean, that's it's a huge challenge. Um, and I think I like what you said. Start start doing small because if 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 libraries are offering programs, then they can kind of <laughs> offer more on a small scale make STEM, STEM programming or makerspace type programming. So they don't necessarily have to do everything all at once. Um, and also just because of the more libraries that do it, the more resources that are available online, the more examples, um, a lot of other communities can take that. I know I have a friend who mentors teens and he's taken some of my ideas uh, within his community. So it, it can happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's not without its challenges. Uh, yeah, so I, I agree. Definitely there, there are unique challenges in areas that maybe are lower socioeconomic status, um, maybe have, you know, schools that are not quite as well funded. Um, I think definitely a makerspace can be really successful in that environment. I think really the main, the main difference is in things like, you know, budget and equipment and, uh, where, what exactly you're going to have that's part of the maker space. So like what I was saying before, um, maybe those areas are not able to go out and purchase the 3D printer and the soldering equipment and the laser cutter and all of that right off the bat. Um, but they, there's so many other ways to make and there's so many other ways for people to 
explore making and to take part in that in the library, that I think it still can be hugely successful. Um, I think also, it, I mean, I think this is important for all maker spaces in libraries, but especially in areas that uh, might be underfunded or might be struggling with that, it's so important to work with partners in the community as well. So there are so many existing uh, maker spaces that are just sort of standalone outside of libraries. Um, like, you know, we have Tech Shop, uh, we have a lot of standalone maker spaces where people from the community might already be going. So you might already have not only a maker space in your community, but makers in the community. And I think it's really important for libraries to take advantage of that and to work with the makers already existing in the community, which I think can get over some of those budget problems. Um, like I know, and Ann Arbor District Library, which uh, I used to work at the University of Michigan, so I used to live in Ann Arbor, um, and that's not that's not an underfunded library, but uh, they did a lot of work with a local makerspace, All Hands Active, uh, and I think that was really great because they weren't recreating what already existed. It wasn't like, well, there's this really successful makerspace in town, let's just make our own and make it totally separate, but let's work with what already exists, let's bring them into the library as partners. Um, I think that can be really successful, uh, and I think it can be really successful as well to, in, in communities to think about uh, the actual, the interests and the possible career trajectories of the people in those communities. So, you know, if you're in an area with lower uh, socioeconomic status, maybe people are not going off to be coders and to be part of startups and things like that. Maybe your focus is on some more hands-on making. Maybe there are a lot of people who uh, are going to become farmers, who are becoming, a, you know, like working on a, like car mechanics or something like that. Um, and then maybe that's the making that gets incorporated into your library. And that's the type of education is something that's more along the lines of what the, is relevant to the people in that community. I think that's a, a really important key to success in those type of communities. That's, uh yeah, I'll definitely want to come bring it back around again to that topic of education and kind of what are our benchmarks for success on that. But I did want to make sure that we didn't go too long without bringing Mark into the conversation. But I know you're a man who's literally in the business of, of training people. So the, first the plugs, right? All right. So please, uh, please visit our booth, um, 344. Uh, so we're, we have a, a little booth here to, to come visit. Um, and, and by the way, we have a location two blocks away. We do free tours between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. Don't tell all your friends, please. <laughs> so y'all go, but don't tell everybody. Uh, we'll get we'll get completely slammed. Um, uh, but please, yeah, please stop by. Uh, so so we've launched. Um, we just announced about a month ago. We've launched the Makerspace Academy uh, this summer, and the objective is to to try to help. Um, teach 1,000 locations across the U.S. how to uh, fund, open, run a, a maker space. Um, and so we've got eight years of experience in the space. We've opened eight locations across the U.S., helped a whole bunch of other folks. And so that's, the, that's kind of one, one of our primary objectives. Um, by the end of the summer, we're hoping to be able to stream it live so you don't actually have to come to, uh, to a location. But we'll be in D.C., Pittsburgh, Chicago, and San Francisco uh, over the summer. Um, and it's very exciting to see libraries getting excited uh, about maker spaces. And I, I, think, I think the most important thing that may, may have come up is leverage the community. You do not need to become the expert on how to strip down and tear down a, a 3D printer and rebuild it. You can if you want to, um, but there are resources in the community um, that know how to do that, and just you, know, you can reach out and find them, and they they will come. It's part of the gestalt of the entire maker movement that it is kind of it's community based, it's collaborative. There's a lot of play and involvement, um, and so if you just kind of if you can build the the framework and the architecture to be able to support the programs and you, you do that explicitly, they will evolve right in front of your face, and resources will show up and, and, and work it. And that's, it's really critical. Do not attempt to do all of this on your own, um, because you don't need to. And, and the real life is in building the community that will show up and, and have a lot of fun. And um, you know, so that's, I mean, that's a core kind of building principle. Make sure that engage the community, rely on them to figure out how to do the MakerBot thing. 
Like we have 13 year olds that are tearing our MakerBots apart and rebuilding them. Thankfully, um, because they tend to break, and and you know, you don't need to learn how to learn how to do all that. So far, a lot of our discussion has has focused a lot on on the issues with respect to children, students, um, student age people. Um, well, I guess. It, before I move on to some of those other sort of age groups, because I think we have talked about this really at every age, this, this can really be relevant. But I do want to bring it back to education, because especially in this context of where we're talking about STEM, that does seem so central to it. Um, if I'm going to be very skeptical or a cynic about this, I could look at this and say, well, this is fascinating. And I can see where this would be, you know, to be driving a lot of sort of like, you know, hobby level interest, and it's great to have people doing these kinds of things. But how do we how do we manage to translate this kind of interest into something that's more explicitly helping to advance whatever the educational goals um, that people have? Because certainly one of the, the you know it's fantastic to have activities like this that are driven um, by passion, by, by natural curiosities, and having sort of organic growth of knowledge that way. But it can be a little tough to make that sort of thing mesh with a big curriculum for a lot of different sorts of people. And I don't, I, I mean, I just, I say this out of genuine uh, naivete, somebody else there may know, I don't know what sorts of studies exist at this point about being able to establish yet how well doing this really does feed into those programs. So, Shona, do you, do you know much about this at this point? I, I do think that there have not been a lot of studies specifically about maker spaces and uh, maybe the the effect on learning. Uh, I do think that maker spaces fit perfectly into uh, the idea of connected learning. Mm -hmm. And there has been research on connected learning and the benefits of that. That's definitely if I were trying to sort of you know sell this to somebody, uh, I would talk about connective learning and its effectiveness. Um, I think that maker spaces definitely fit right in with uh, those ideals. Um, I also think that uh, there's been research. Um, I know I was, I was actually looking at something yesterday in a poster session um, that there it's really important for. Uh, learners to have both structured and unstructured learning, and that you really one or the other is not going to be fully effective, but there, there needs to be time for that structured, more uh, rigid learning that sort of might happen in a formal classroom setting, but there also needs to be time for that more informal sort of explore, uh, exploratory learning um, that's happening in a much less structured way. So I think there has been research on sort of peripheral things, not necessarily like this makerspace specifically helped learning in this way. I think people are starting to get into that. Um, and that's something I'm really interested to actually see where that goes. Um, I would love if anyone in the audience like has more about you know, how their makerspace has been trying to assess um, for learning outcomes, I would love to hear about that. But I, I do think it's tough because there's kind of a tension between uh, we want to assess, especially in a school or a library setting, we want to assess for learning. We want to assess maybe for certain learning outcomes, but you also don't want to make it too systematic in order to assess that. So I think there definitely is a tension there, which makes it difficult to study, um, though I would really love to hear if anybody is working on that. I'd love to hear more about it. I was just going to add uh, in terms of creativity and, and testing that and um, that our creativity scores in America have have been on the decline. Um, and just thinking about how uh, not all these disciplines um, are promoting kids, whether it's problem solving or think, just think, being creative thinkers. Um, so you don't just have to focus on art, on the arts to do that. Uh, so that's also, especially when thinking of, you know, having kids become global leaders, that's, that's increasingly important as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there aren't uh, there aren't studies yet. So please submit your NSF grant and and try to do it. Try to do it. I mean, I, I, there's there's plenty of research though that suggests that upwards at least of a, like a third of the population learns um, kinetically rather than auditory or, or visually, and and we've completely left them behind um, with the with the common core and everything else. We won't go down that path. Um, <laughs> So, but we have really amazing anecdotes where we're engaging uh, students in ways that that uh, really excite them. And uh, my favorite one at, at the moment, um, we were we were sponsored by uh, General Electric and Beth Comstock, the CMO, um, who should be the CEO, next CEO, by the way. She's just truly remarkable. 
Um, and they did a pop-up um, advanced manufacturing um, event in Austin, Texas. And a 14-year-old freshman in high school, young lady, came through, saw it, dr drug her father over there, who was there to do the gaming convention, um, and said, you know, hey, I, we need to spend some time at this pop -up. So she learned how to play with the 3D printer and the laser cutter, and she saw the CNC machines, and, and then eventually got really enamored with the welding machine, and so got, actually got to play with the welding machine, which, by the way, is a lot of fun. There's flames everywhere, and you, you get all dressed up. You do this metamorphosis thing. Um, and, uh, and then uh, GE was giving away, so they were actually working on something practical. They were doing um, uh, bicycle racks, and we were leaving the bi bicycle racks behind. And she asked, well, do you have a home for all the bicycle racks? The answer was no. It's like, can, my, can, I, can we do one at my high school? And, of course, we eventually got permission from the principal to, yeah, we can do it at high school. So she came back the next day and spent literally like six to eight hours welding on her bicycle rack that was going to go at her high school. And uh, Beth came by because she, she was speaking at the event and was curious, you know, how is this advanced manufacturing pop-up working at South by Southwest? Because it is kind of a weird thing. It's not gaming. It's not pure education and so forth. And so she came by, and uh, this young lady said, I have to talk to Miss, Miss Comstock. And so she went up to Miss Comstock and said, I am going to become an engineer because of this experience. Now, Beth immediately then wrote a big check, and we're now going doing this all over the world. <laughs> I could not possibly have come up with a better, you know, uh, better instance. You know, there, for, the, for the third of the people that learn through their belly button, this is really, really, really critical. Um, and it's a lot of fun. And it, so it adds play to the, uh, to the environment. And, and so, yeah, we need the NSF folks to study. But you guys already know people love to work with their hands. It's kind of it's, it's fundamental. And putting these maker spaces that enable these kids to understand, you know, that math does matter, that science does matter, is really huge. And I'm not going to leave, it, leave out art because it, 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 um, we love our artists because they add a spice to the to the space that's absolutely amazing. Um, but hands-on learning is really critical, and we basically ripped it out of the high schools and junior highs. It's it's going to come back, and elementary schools. No, it's an it's an unmitigated disaster in my mind. But thankfully, this this movement is really taking off. Uh, and, 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 and we'll see it come back. Yeah. At McGraw-Hill Education and with Access Science, we've been, you know, uh, this, been on this bandwagon now for this, for this past year very, very happily. And you know, something that we started to talk about is that we didn't want to be just talking the talk about this. And we wanted to see what else we could do to try to advance that. Um, and I will say that something that we, that we just recently we started to get a, little, a tiny little bit of skin in the game ourselves with something that just actually we just debuted this, uh, 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 this past week uh, on Access Science, which is a, a new area within that. So Access Science, uh, if you're all familiar with it, is a, an online general science reference the best there possibly could be, of course. But I think, um, but you know, the, the important thing is that, that, that you know, we're trying to, to develop whatever that means. So you know, a lot of the content of what has been in Access Science has been the sort of thing that you would traditionally associate with things like encyclopedia-like articles. But I think we need to be able to grow something past that. We were trying to figure out, well, what, you know, could we possibly do? And Steve Chapman and I were talking, we realized that, of course, that uh, McGraw-Hill Education has been involved in this area in a long time uh, under its tab imprint of books. We have an enormous number. I, I don't know how large the catalog of, of over 100 different books in lots of different areas of electronics and uh, uh, carpentry and all sorts of different sorts of, of things. So we realized that we could start to adapt some of that content. So um, what we've started to do now is we've, we've now just uh, this past week, we've added a different area among other kinds of enhancements on access science. We've uh, rolled out in the middle of things on the homepage. You can see that we've created this area that we're calling the, the, the projects section. And it's, it's dedicated to sort of makerspace activity. Going through that, we have started to create, at this point, just a small number of uh, different projects um, taken from these tab books, and you click on any one of those links, and you uh, go to ones of different, uh, you know, varieties of, of different sorts of projects that people can build and experiments that people would be able to do, and we've tried to standardize the presentation of those as much as possible in adapting that content so that, you know, for example, it's always very clear who the, the author of each one is and the credentials they have that they bring to any of this, the description of what the project is, uh, the source, 
detailed lists of the parts and that kind of thing, very step-by-step -step, uh, descriptions of what people need to do, along with illustrations. We try to make sure that if there are any sorts of safety advisories that would be in place, we have this there. Um, and, uh, you know, including any kinds of schematics and circuitry of that sort. But uh, I think the thing that, that, uh, that makes this relevant to access science is that we display these kinds of projects and then also have these kinds of links in place for context to connect it back to the other content that is in there. So that if, for example, you are doing the project about you know, how to build a constant speed vehicle, that this does relate back to the other sorts of articles and animations that we have about conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. We think that's a way of you know, taking the, the physical involvement, that activity, and then relaying that over into something we'd hope that would inspire people to be trying to learn more about all of that. So it's a very new thing for us. It's, very, it's, it's just, at this point, just sort of a, a pilot stage. But if anybody does, uh, if any of our Access Science subscribers are here, if they do want to check this out and send us some sort of feedback about that, we would very much welcome it because it's something we would like to try to continue to expand and improve more um, over time. You know, again, we've talked a lot about the student age. I wanted to talk and make sure that we at least in this portion of things address people outside of strictly student ages because libraries, especially public libraries, community assets, and we want to make sure that we're therefore serving a lot of the adult community. And maybe also particularly it's worth you know, pausing to talk about um, more of the, the senior community that way because they are maybe not a lot of the ones that we first think of when it comes to things like 3D printing, um, what's been the experience that you've all seen in your different venues with, uh, with interest uh, in this from these kind of these non-student constituencies uh, and what can be done to help to get people more involved in that or more prepared to participate in it? You know, let, let me sell the movement for just a, just a little bit. Um, you know, one of the questions you're probably going to get is why should we be doing this now um, rather than like 10 or 15 or 20 or 50 years ago. Why, why, why does this make sense for a library now? Um, and, and so from the, from the meta themes that are going on in this space, um, you know, libraries are all about access and access to knowledge and community and so forth. And what's happened in the last 15 years roughly um, is, is truly revolutionary, which is why I call it a manifesto. Uh, it is truly revolutionary. The, the tools... Um, have gotten incredibly cheap, relatively speaking. Um, they are incredibly powerful. The range of things that a 3D printer can do and some of these CNC, small desktop CNC tools can do is, is truly um, mind-blowing. Um, and relatively speaking, these are really easy to use. I mean, historically, if you wanted to, to learn how to use a mill, this is a six-month to two-year and, and, and longer um, thing. And this, the mill is literally what created capitalism. Like 200 years ago, it was the mill and hooking it up to um, steam initially and then eventually electricity that caused the aggregation of capital to build these really expensive, difficult-to-use machines. Well, now you can buy another mill from Diane App Applestone's company um, for like 1500 bucks. And you can download the software to run it for free, and you can teach yourself or your friends how to use it at a nominal level you know, in, in the afternoon. That is truly revolutionary. We are now occupying a, occupying a space where if you can imagine it in the morning, many things can be made in the evening the afternoon. And, and libraries, historically, as, you know, as a shining light of access, can help drive, uh, drive that. Um, and it cuts across socioeconomic and demographic uh, patterns in, in ways that are truly exciting. So probably relative to that, my favorite story there is uh, Mark Roth um, was uh, here in San Francisco homeless and uh, living in a shelter. And a couple of uh, other homeless folks had come through the, the art tech shop two blocks up, got a little brochure, did the free tour, and then came back and said, you know, this probably isn't for us, and they threw it away. Well, Mark dove into the little trash can, pulled it out, and read it, says, maybe this is for me. 
because um, he had fallen through the cracks. He was a smart guy, had, had been a programmer before, um, but had a, developed a medical problem, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he came in and became a member, uh, took one class, the laser cutter class, and rebooted his entire life. Uh, he, he learned the laser cutter on like a Wednesday. On Thursday, he came in for his, his two hours, because we limit the number of hours that you can use it, otherwise people go into massive manufacturing and you can't really support that. Uh, but he came in, went to the trash can, pulled stuff out, um, used material that had been left, cut some things out, went back out on the street, and sold the stuff that he was making. And step and repeat, make tchotchkes, come into tech shop in the morning, come up with some ideas, download some ideas, you know, cut it out, go out on the street, sell what I just made, step and repeat, step and repeat. And then eventually he started teaching other people how to use the laser cutter. He became an instructor. We didn't know he was homeless. Um, and then convinced a member to help fund his own laser cutter company, and now he's got like three employees. His wife and kids moved back in. Um, more importantly, he then launched his own 501c3 called the Learning Shelter, and he's raised money, and he goes back out into the community, pulls homeless people um, out of the community, gets them housing, food, transportation, a three-month membership and mentoring and training so that they can launch their own business or go get a job. Holy cow. You know, this, his total, I mean, his initial expense was 50 bucks. He used his, you know, he literally used his last welfare check to last $50 to kind of reboot it. Now, for those of you um, who have the opportunity to build something bigger, um, this, again, I'm, I'm building the case on why you want to have these things. We are living in an entirely new world. The last 15 years has fundamentally changed everything about making things. We routinely see people launch very successful businesses with incredibly, sh in incredibly short periods of time. And I've got some examples. Probably our most famous one, which I won't talk about a lot, but Square came out of our Menlo Park location. So it's, you know, it's now a $6 billion valuation company. They have 1,000 employees. And uh, uh, James uh, McKelvey um, came to our Menlo Park location, learned how to use a mill, learned how to use a lathe, learned the basic electronics to build the core electronics to launch this company. And he did it in about three or four months. Um, his, you know, he, he was a glass blower from St. Louis. So a glass blower from St. Louis with access to the tools has completely changed the banking industry um, in the United States in the last three years, which is, which is truly remarkable. Um, one of my other favorites is, is the Dodo case, and Patrick Buckley came in and said, what classes do I need to take to learn how to make an iPad case out of bamboo and bookbinding? It was three classes. Ninety days later, he had sold a million dollars in product. Learn the skills you need, launch a company, <clears throat> and have a million dollars in sales in the span of a typical quarter at a high school or a college. So, I mean, it's it, it truly remarkable. He did... $4 million in sales in the first year, $10 million in the second, $35 million in the third. Saved a bookbinding company um, here in, in San Francisco. He's got the manufacturing companies here in San Francisco. The president of the United States carries one of these cases. Um, and he's actually, I, I met him, and, he, and he's proud of it. You're like, he's like, look what I got. This is, a, one, of, this is one of my favorite things. It's, um, it's remarkable. Probably one of my favorite c current ones. Um, and again, this is if you, can, if you can build a bigger one, you have to come to the academy because we can teach you all the ins and outs of doing it. And you should build a bigger one if you can. Start small, but go get the money to build a bigger one because this, these things, these are, are economic uh, engines, they're educational platforms, they're you know, cross generational and, and, and cross socio demographic uh, community centers. Um, but these four ladies came out of, of Carnegie Mellon, um, uh, they're all mechanical engineers. And, um, and I, I, I ran into them at our, at our Pittsburgh location. And they're trying to solve a problem that I, I didn't realize uh, w was a problem. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Doesn't fit me. Um, so, uh, you know, it turns out that if, if you've got large breasts, 90% of the weight is covered on your shoulders. And what they've done, these are mechanical engineering students, right? Um, they've completely re-architected the underwire. There's, it, and it shifts the weight. 70% of the weight now is covered by the rib cage and the spinal column instead of, of the backs. And uh, they raised like thirty-five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 on Kickstarter. Um, they, and what they did was they, it was pretty fun. They had their 
boyfriend. They did a video clip. It's like, my boyfriends don't understand why this is a big deal. Um, and so they outfitted their boyfriends with an old bra, got them melons, and had them jumping around. <laughs> and things, things fell out. And <laughs> Uh, and I, I, the, the one guy, was, he, was kind of, he came over and he's like, you know, I just had my 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> this wasn't what I was thinking it was going to be like. <laughs> um, and then I, yeah, at, the, at the pinnacle, um, and this is why I, I get so passionate about this, um, you know, these are fun examples, but we've had people have changed the world uh, as a result of having access to tools at 150 bucks a month. In a library, you can give it away for free if you've got the if you've got the funding stream. So Jane Chan and her um, her cohort were at the Stanford D School, and they came up with this idea to to create a, a baby blanket to help, or an incubator blanket to help uh, preemies that were born two or three weeks too early. Their hypothalamus isn't fully developed. You have one hour. They call it the golden hour, because at the end of the golden hour you die. Five hundred thousand babies die every year because they can't get to a an incubator fast enough. And so they said, "Well, we should create a little papoose and put some technology in it." And so they came up with a design. And by the time they finished the the, the program at Stanford, they had it up to an hour. Universities are great, but they tend to be closed systems. But you, you once you graduate, you, they kick you out. Like you got your degree, so go away. Um, and now you lose access to the tools. So historically, what that would mean is if these students had world-beating ideas, they would then go get a job somewhere else, and the idea died with them, right? Um, thankfully, we, we were open by that time, and so she and, and Naganan Murthy, uh, Jane Chan and Naganan Murthy came in, and uh, Naganan then um, engaged our community, and this is the real value of what happened here. And they headed up to one hour. Um, by themselves. They came into the community and a um, polymer scientist from a major research institute found out what they were doing, came over, sat down with Naganon, and improved the functionality to, uh, to four hours instead of one, or to, uh, five hours instead of two. And it turns out that's a 300% just on its core, but because of the geographic reach, it's actually a, a nine-fold um, improvement. And here's the punchline. This thing has saved 150,000 babies so far. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a little blanket. You put a polymer pouch in the back. They heat it using some uh, basic electricity or over boiling water. Um, it's in India and China and, and, and Africa now. And, and Jane is now a World Economic Fellow and has gotten all kinds of awards. It saved 150,000 babies. You know, this is a 24-year-old kid who without access to these kinds of tools, without the inspiration that can come from a library by exposing them to these things, um, these, you know, these babies have been saved. It's a, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing. So if you can build a bigger one and you can't, I, I, I highly encourage you, but start small and, uh, and build it up. But that's why we're doing this. It's fundamentally different today than it was 15 years ago. The tools are easy, powerful, and cheap. And by tapping into the community that then shows up, it's an exponential improvement in the, you know, in the outcomes of what people are trying to do. It's fantastic. And, you know, obviously every, every project and every makerspace isn't going to be able to, to come up with those kinds of successes. But it's, it's so wonderful to contemplate the idea of these kinds of successes, this kind of energy existing in enough libraries that just communities look to libraries as that, that, that focal point for that sort of creativity, as a, as a place that is an engine for so much creativity and where great ideas uh, would be coming from. That's what libraries have always been, but we've, we've not given it that kind of focus at, uh, as, a, as a culture for such a long time. And this is a way to, 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 to re-energize that. At this point, uh, I'd like to really try to bring all of you into the conversation uh, as much as possible. So uh, if you have any kinds of, of questions or comments, definitely glad to have them. So uh, the question is, in this case, in the situation of in libraries where a space for to be able to make a maker space doesn't already exist, how do you then still work with people who are able to come in and try to, to build on that expertise? Maker space without space, go. So I know that. Uh, as one example, Allen County Public Library, which I'm totally blanking out right now on where they are, um, but I know that they've uh, done this really successful partnership with 
tech venture makerspace, which is a makerspace in the area, um, and they, rather than having the makerspace in the library, have like a trailer in the parking lot, essentially, um, where through this partnership, they have built a makerspace in this trailer. So that's one really successful example of a library working with a community partner to build a makerspace without actually having dedicated space in the library. Um, another really successful program uh, that I've seen has been, um, it's called Michigan Makers, uh, and that's run by Kristen Fonticero, who's a professor at the School of Information at University of Michigan. And essentially what she does is she brings grad students from the School of Information to uh, K through 12 schools in the area that um, you know, don't have that dedicated space, don't have resources, they come with the equipment. So in this case, they're the partners. They come with the equipment uh, and with the grad students who are the teachers and have some of the expertise and they work with the students and it's sort of like a pop-up makerspace, so to speak. Um, so that's another great way to work with partners is to have sort of like these pop-up makerspaces that are not necessarily a dedicated space that's always there, um, but that is there on a regular basis. Um, I've seen people do like mobile maker spaces, which are kind of like kits that travel around. Um, I believe that Ann Arbor District Library, in working with uh, the local maker space All Hands Active, they've had them do workshops at the library. Um, I think they actually collaborated on like a podcast together. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to sort of use the experts that are in those spaces to either uh, teach people from the library community. Um, to come in and bring some of their equipment with them. Uh, another really good thing a library can do, especially if you don't have dedicated space, is to hold a maker fair. Hmm. Uh, maker fairs are a great way not only uh, to you know, have people come to the library and explore making and experience making, but to meet a lot of the makers in the community and to meet people that you can then partner with and bring into the library who have expertise. Uh, so that's another really great partnership opportunity. Um, if you don't know what a maker fair is, it's essentially a lot of uh, makers come together and they showcase what they've been working on and they talk about it. A lot of the times at maker fairs, there will be like make and take activities so you can do making at the maker fair itself. Um, and that's something, you know, you can hold that in like a library parking lot. You can hold that in a public space. It doesn't have to be like you have a huge dedicated venue for that. Um, so those are just a couple examples off the top of my head. Again, in the absence of sort of maker spaces or, or certain other expertise, the value of, again, reaching out to different sorts of clubs and other sets of people who had that kind of expertise and interest. And in a lot of cases, once they were aware that if you had a problem, they were happy to jump in and share whatever they needed that was possible. And you also made the point that uh, it, the, the very interesting area of the, the rise of uh, do-it-yourself biology maker spaces, and right, that's something, that's a, that's a whole other category of things, but uh, as somebody whose background is in biology, I find it cool as can be that that's, uh, that's going to be. Um, so yes, the other two follow-up questions on that, still following along at home, are... Uh, <laughs> The, the, the question was about uh, staffing and what kind of staffing was, was needed to try to be able to have uh, a program like the one that Claire has as, as at Darien, and also then the issue of soldering. How indeed do you manage to convince all the appropriate people and things to get, to get that happening inside? Oh, so quickly, we, we do not have them sign a waiver, so what I, I made it a family program. So I had the child had to have an adult with them, so they did it together. Mainly the child was ended up doing it. And just focusing a lot in the beginning, explaining about safety and uh, just having the parent there. I mean, we've only had maybe one minor burn, um, which, you know, I think <laughs> the child was so interested in getting back to it. I said, oh, did that hurt? And she goes, oh, yeah, both is fine. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how I got around it because I knew that that would come. We, we do have waivers for if children are using the tea room in general because they, they have to have an adult with them. And so because we're not monitoring, we might give them kind of, and this is where staffing, you know, I, w I won't lie, it is kind of challenging because not only do we have to staff someone on the desk, but we do, if we have a tea room appointment, have to have a librarian kind of explain the process of using the maker bot. Usually it doesn't take up the whole time, but just kind of having that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but that's something our staff in general is is kind of comfortable with. Our our tech staff they do one on ones with patrons a lot of times for various tech needs. Uh, but 
I, I mean, again, I'm fortunate to have a lot of children's staff that um, that is, you know, open to learning how to manage the technology piece, and, and that comes to with circulating technology as well. And, and we do that all within the children's library, which I know a lot of libraries don't necessarily do that. Uh, but, but yeah, staffing can be a challenge. Um, and also, I was going to say, uh, in terms of having... Um, just also workshops for staff in general that might not be doing a lot of the maker activities, maybe having a staff day or a staff meeting where it's kind of like an, an open house where everyone comes in. I know libraries have done that uh, just to share the experience with everyone on staff um, who might not have those leanings, but it's, and it's also just a great um, kind of uh, collaborative opportunity for staff. Good. I don't know if that, hopefully that answers. A couple of things. First, on the, on the staffing side, um, you staff a community organizer, not a technician. The organizer brings the technicians into the library, and you leverage the existing knowledge in the community. Waiting to, to train up the staff is going to take too long, and there's too many things going on. And so really, the, the staff's job is not to learn how to use every single tool. What they can if they want. It's like a lot of fun. Um, but it's really as a community organizer to engage the rest of the, rest of the community because the expertise is out there. It's in every, every single community. Um, nobody's ever died using a, a, a soldering iron. Uh, um, and so you have that to... That wasn't a challenge, everybody. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was not a challenge. See, see who can do it first. So you've got you to knock that down and be pretty aggressive about it. Um, you know, our, we, we, knock on wood, we've never had a major injury at a tech shop, and we got serious tools that could theoretically kill you. Um, it turns out in maker spaces, people aren't doing the things that typically lead to in injuries in a, in, a, in a traditional industrial sense. The activities that we're doing... Um, uh, just, I won't go into all the details, but it's, it's, just, it's not that r uh, risky. I do recommend having them sign a waiver, but not because it's going to get you off in a, in a legal environment. It's just to communicate the safety protocols that are in, in involved in that particular space. So you can't even go through our space without signing a waiver. We basically shred them. Right? You, don't tell anybody. But you sign the waiver not because we think it'll save us in a lawsuit. We, we have you sign the waiver so that you understand that you're operating a different kind of space. And that's actually the key. The key is a, is a mental socialization of making sure that you're aware of what's going on. And so the waiver is really just a, a useful tool to reinforce and to make sure that everybody understands when you're in this space, you can get a little blister. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say about the staffing issues and playing off um, what Mark was saying, too, uh, that I've seen some libraries successfully do makers and residence programs, which can also help alleviate some of the staffing issues. And essentially that involves, uh, you know, makers from the community who already have some of these skills that are uh, becoming a part of this maker space on a regular basis. And either those are people who are getting paid for that type of position uh, or I've actually seen some programs where, for instance, um, if it's an artist who, um, you know, like a local artist, the library might have a deal where, oh, uh, we're going to display some of your art for this period of time. Um, we're going to uh, host an exhibit. Um, and in exchange, you will work as a maker in residence for this amount of time. Um, so that's a, just another option to explore is sort of bringing in those people with the skills, like Mark said, um, not necessarily having to train up your staff, but taking advantage of the community, and those people then can alleviate some of the staffing issues as well. Good. So c flexible, creative approaches to the, to the staffing issue. How can librarians be working to collaborate with the schools and with the teachers to, again, try to integrate those activities together? I, what I can speak to is that, that we have had... Uh, whether it's teachers or the librarians coming in and ask, inquiring about the space. Uh, and also recently, one of the schools, they're thinking of redesigning their media center. So they've, they've more come to ask um, questions about how we're using the space to see. But there's always room for extra, extra collaboration uh, with those groups. Um, and also, not just the schools, but we try to collaborate and uh, get a lot of the other organizations, whether it's scouting, I know that they've shown a lot of interest in coming in uh, and just having, whether it's bat the badges that they're earning or just uh, whatever focus they're on to come in and kind of have that uh, just be, you know, they can, <laughs> they can look at the tea room and, and see what uh, 3D technology can, can uh, work with that. But, um, 
but yeah, I, as for now, we've just have we all, we've also been approached by a lot of the parents who've coordinated the after school activities um, and just trying to see if we would be willing. I don't know if any libraries have had that experience, but see if we would be willing to come in and host after school programs, which at this point we're not we're not able you know we're not able to do because we have we offer so much programming within the library. Uh, but it's just, it's, it's been nice to see kind of the schools kind of taking. I, I think they're really, because it's a small town, a lot of the parents have been more vocal about having the schools come and uh, talk to us more, which is good. So the Carson City, Nevada Digitorium as an example of one that is, that is working well to, to integrate itself with the rest of the community's school system as, as an activity for that. Good. Excellent. Thank you. She was, is it possible... Do other successful programs have some kinds of lesson plans that could be shared with other, other, uh, other, other libraries and schools that would be looking to try to build on that success? I mean, we do have a section in the tea room that has a lot of the projects that we have offered, um, more links to resources that we've used to develop those programs. Uh, the only the only thing currently we have is because a lot of uh, the families are using the space and you know the initial like when they go in we we do kind of like the introduction to what the space is if they're interested in reserving the MakerBot uh, but one of my colleagues has done a great job of uh, compiling all the different programs that we've done over the years and just having little how tos so basically that's all available to to our patrons uh, which also from time to time we have. Uh, librarians asking us to kind of share those resources so that's just something I mean it to be honest like the first six months to a year we we were having you know there wasn't enough time to to kind of document all of that so that's something we've had a chance to go back and start to do mm -hmm. which has been helpful to you know to us just to have kind of a catalog of what what we've done in the space Shona is that the kind of thing do uh, the the participants in in maker bridge is that the sort of thing that they seem interested in, in trying to do or that they do you think that they might be prompted to do? Yeah, uh, well, I was actually going to just do a shameless plug and say uh, MakerBridge, like we have a resources section that is absolutely the type of thing I would love to have in the resources section, which the entire purpose of it is to, you know, help people building maker spaces and libraries and schools and things like that to share resources with each other. Um, so if you do have lesson plans and resources and things like that, please come talk to me. I would love to share that on MakerBridge. Yeah. Commenting on the uh, success of makerspaces in academic libraries. Uh, I mean, I, I work in an academic library right now. I work at SUNY Oswego, um, and they have uh, a makerspace there. It's sort of um, what I think of as like the beginnings of a makerspace where there's, uh, there's a few 3D printers, and then there's um, multimedia production labs and some digitization equipment and things like that. Uh, from what I have noticed, just looking at what's going on in uh, the field, I definitely think um, academic libraries are a little bit behind in the trend. I think that public libraries and schools are definitely diving into it much faster than academic libraries. Um, I think part of the, maybe the holdup for academic libraries is also that there are often other um, departments on campus that will have some of this equipment. So, you know, maybe like the engineering department has its own 3D printers or its own uh, soldering equipment or whatever. Um, and that often will prevent the library from getting those things as well. I do think it's important though, because often that equipment is only accessible to the people in that program. Um, and I think that it can be useful on a much larger scale. Uh, I know that so I, I have not been at SUNY Oswego very long. Um, so some of the experience that I know of with the 3D printer is not my personal experience, but I do know that when they first got their first MakerBot, um, there was just such a, an interest across all disciplines. It wasn't just you know the engineering students who were coming in. I think actually the first student who used the 3D printer was a zoology student who printed like a snake skull. Um, so there's, there's just so much potential for this to be used across uh, disciplines and in areas where you wouldn't normally expect these tools to be used. I know also like the theater department has used the 3D printer to print little like models for set building and things like that. Um, I think it's really important to make those tools then accessible not only for specific departments. I do think academic libraries have been a little bit behind in that. 
Um, but I definitely think that it can be very successful and that there have been very successful maker spaces in academic libraries. Yeah, actually, I, I think this is one of the biggest opportunities um, th that there is, frankly. Uh, so I, I visited Carnegie Mellon. Um, you know, we announced we we're going to open a, a, our space if it's about a mile down the road. And the three different departments reached out to me independently and said, you got to come visit. And finally, I said, let's just all meet for lunch. Um, they had never met one another. The, the person who was running the engineering school um, space, the architectural school space, and the art school space had never met one another. We proceeded to introduce one another, and then we went on a tour around the, the uh, Carnegie to see where all of these spaces were. And, and by the way, they were, they were underfunded, they were poorly designed, they, they were an afterthought because it doesn't necessarily lead to a degree. So the academic libraries have an opportunity to step into a void that's absolutely screaming to be solved. Yeah. And by the way, these, these things are so poorly run, so poorly run, Yale had a death about six years ago as a result of it. So there, you know, if you have these machines, they are on campus and they are not being supervised in the way that they need to. So from a liability perspective, you can knock that one down right away. It's like we want to reduce our liability by aggregating these tools, and then you open it up to all the disciplines so the cross disciplines can actually work together. And my last little plug there is, and whatever you do, make sure that's open to the public. Um, that's the one thing the academic folks have not solved and, and need to. So I love Georgia Tech. It's phenomenal. They have a, an incredible maker space. You have 2,000 kids that are coming through on a monthly basis using it, and it's two blocks from the public, and nobody from the public is allowed on campus to do, go do that. And that is an absolute, complete, total travesty. Ace, I really wanted to thank all of you for your participation. It was just wonderful to, to have you here this morning. It made it great. And, of course, our panelists, first rate, as I knew they would be. Thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of the conference.